Hey guys, welcome back to a brand new video, and today we're going to be looking at the 2022 house selections and the role that redistricting will play in them. So we're just going to go state by state. I'm going to make a couple more redistricting predictions on a DRA, but we're going to go state by state and just kind of make a rough estimate of a of likely pickups. Um, so yeah, now a like let's use Kansas as an example. Let's say that 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 I have a district as, you know, I guess what we'd call safer holding it. And that means it's extremely likely that the GOP picks up a seat in the state. If we have a seat like this, that means, you know, it's they're probably gonna pick up a state, but I wouldn't you know, it's not a guarantee. If it's lean, it's like they might pick it up. I'm not sure if I bet on it though, and then tilt is a very, very small chance. Now I'm not going to use tilt a ton because I think it's a waste of my time to just say there's a very, very small chance that uh, the GOP can, you know, that a party would pick up a seat, and I'll tell you why in a second. So here's an example. So Alabama, the Democrats uh, are guaranteed a seat essentially because of the Voting Rights Act, which means you have to have a seat in, in Alabama that uh, is majority black. And so they have that in uh, Terry Sewell's district right here that kind of stretches across the rural black areas to Montgomery up to Birmingham. So it serves as a pack of Democratic votes to make sure that none of these other Republican districts become competitive. So, uh, currently, uh, there has been talk about Alabama getting a second Democratic district. And I think this is unlikely for a couple reasons. So, the GOP has complete control of Alabama. They have the, go the, 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 the governor, Kay Ivey, is a Republican. In the state legislature, the Republicans have a supermajority. They have complete control of the uh, state. So, uh, you know, Alabama, they don't need to add another Democratic district when all the, like, they don't need to shore up any incumbents. All their seats, a couple of them are trending blue, but they're all at least R plus 25, I believe. So none of their seats need to be shored up for, like, another 20 or 30 years. And um, realistically speaking, the seat that they have that just packs the Democrats into one district, it's satisfactory enough for them. So they're going to keep Terry Sewell. They, they basically have to... And they're going to keep her seat as a safe blue seat. But other than that, they can't do anything. So, you know, if, if I was going to rate this, I'd say, you know, tilt, put a chance for a Democratic pickup. But I don't even think it's worth talking about. I think that the people who believe it's going to happen, I think they are uh, optimistic Democrats on Twitter. And, you know, it's it's not completely crazy. It's not like, you know, saying that the Democrats are going to Wyoming or anything. But it's unlikely to happen. And I would be very, very surprised if it did happen. So Alabama, no change there. Uh, Alaska, only one seat. Speaking of Alaska, Don Young actually follows me on Twitter. So that's cool. Um, Arkansas, nothing going to change there. The GOP is just going to shore up their incumbents. So I guess we're just going to say that, um, uh, to stay forward. Oh, so Arizona, I think the GOP is going to gain a seat in Arizona. I think it's pretty underrated. I think this is, I'd rate it as likely. So, um, here's the thing. The GOP, uh, in Arizona, they right now have a four to, they're right now losing in the delegation five to four. And, you know, the thing that they have going for them is that their commission, and I say commission kind of in, I guess, with uh, extra emphasis, is because, you know, it's it, it's a Republican-controlled commission. There are, there are going to be some Democrats on it. It's, it's a decently fair commission, but at the end of the day, it is a Republican-leaning commission that's going to draw a Republican-leaning map. Not, not, not necessarily a gerrymander. It's not going to be, like, a really ugly map, but it, it is going to be a map that, you know, maybe it's a little more favorable to Republicans than the current ones. So... They have said that they're going to protect incumbents, and you'd say, okay, if they're going to protect incumbents, shouldn't the map stay 5-4? to four? Well, they have a loophole, and it's because Ann Kirkpatrick in this seat right here for the Democratic Party that she represents is a competitive seat. She's retiring, so the Arizona GOP or the, the, that commission, they can just say, okay, well, we're going to make this seat more Republican because, you know, even though it's held by a Democrat, she's not running for re-election, therefore she's not an incumbent, therefore we can draw her out or make her district more competitive more in our favor. So I think they're going to do that. And I think the GOP, even if they lose the seat in 2022, it'll be by less than they lost to buy in 2020. The seat's going to become a redder because of redistricting. I think right now it's like a D plus four or five seat. Kirkpatrick won re-election. Do I think that amount? It, it could become, I think it'd become an R plus three or four seat. Now, not, not totally unwinnable for Democrats, of course, but still less favorable to them than currently. And I think you know, in, instead of this, I think they're going to shore up probably Tom ha Tom O'Halloran or something because they do have to keep all these Native American areas up here in the district because of the VRA. So that's what's going to happen there. I think a 5-4 to four GOP delegation there is not likely to happen. Um, and then what else do we have? We have uh, California, my home state, and a state the Democrats are likely going to gain. I think they're going to gain at least three seats, potential for uh, five, and then maybe, maybe if they get really aggressive, maybe six or seven, but I, I'd say... Three seats they're probably going to gain. So the commission, similar to Arizona, you know, 
California's commission is pretty biased. It's a it, it's chaired by a Democrat. It's majority Democrat, and it's gonna draw. They're gonna draw a map that's more favorable to the Democratic Party, and at the very least, they're gonna shore up their incumbents and draw at least one LA Republican. You know, whether that be Young Kim or Mike Garcia, or some or, or someone like that. Um, so that is gonna happen, and then I think they're also gonna eliminate a Republican because they're losing a seat. I think they're gonna eliminate a Republican. Um, so. Yeah, actually, I I take that back. I, I think that they actually. Whoops, I think it was a little too aggressive there. There's potential for. I think they're gonna likely gain three seats. I think that they, that if they're lucky, they might gain five. So, oops, that was a little too aggressive because I forgot. I, for some reason, I think there were. I think there are only nine Republicans in the delegation right now. I think they're gonna keep at least, at the very least, uh, four. Um, so, yeah, so California. Uh, I, I think the Democrats, at, at least two seats for sure. Another seat potentially. Uh, two, two seats potentially, then one more if they are really aggressive. Um, so, yeah, Colorado. We we've seen the proposed map, but it, it, it's it's they're gonna have similar versions. So, and I, and I can actually give a detailed explanation of what's going on in Colorado. So, as of right now, the map that's likely gonna pass is a five to three map, which would be a Democratic net of one seat. And so the the, the three GOP seats are a the super red district in the east. They're gonna keep that. They're gonna draw a Colorado Springs based district here. That would be, I think, or an R plus 12 or 14 or something. And then they're going to make a Lauren Boebert seat even more competitive. It's currently around an R plus 9 seat. It, it goes down to around R plus 7. So still a Republican leaning seat for sure that she'd be favored in. But it gets a little more competitive. And, you know, since she's kind of the most vulnerable incumbent of that, you know, more right-wing group of Republicans in Congress, they think the Democrats could really target her and have her potentially lose, um, lose re-election in 2022. And then the Democrats have essentially four pretty safe seats. Then they have one competitive seat that leans towards them. The Joe Biden would have carried by around nine points. Donald Trump would have actually carried it by around a point in 2016, but Joe Biden winning it by nine. Jared Polis, I think, winning it by seven. These would be uh, districts, because it is a suburban Denver district that would be trending blue. So I think a five to three map, they're, they're definitely going to gain a district that would be leaning towards them. If they, you know, they might, there's a small chance the Democrats lose it, but I would still say that it is a seat that would be leaning towards them, and overall, a favorable net map to them in Colorado. Uh, Connecticut, the GOP has a, has a chance of gaining a seat here. It's it's not for sure. I'd say it's like a 64th that they do, so I guess I'll say it's likely that they do, kind of, kind of in the likely category. And so what's going to happen, I think, in Connecticut is that, you know, the Democrats have the governorship and they have a majority in, in, the, in the state legislature, but what they don't have is a supermajority that they need to pass a, um, a map. So instead of, because, because they can't pass a map, the state Supreme Court would draw a map, so instead of, do, of instead of having to go to the state Supreme Court, I think they're just going to uh, kind of agree to a compromise. They're going to make uh, they're going to show up there for incumbents, and then they're going to make Johanna Hayes seat go from a lean Democrat seat, or I guess a likely Democrat seat. But it's I, I think the PBI is it's like it's like D plus four, but Hayes won re-election by like ten last November. So I think they're going to make it go from kind of a lean likely DC to a toss up, maybe tilt Republican seat to satisfy the GOP, uh, the, the couple GOP swing votes that they need in the legislature. So I think that's what we're going to do do there. Hill or nothing going on there. Florida, um, of course, the GOP is likely going to gain at least two seats here. One's just going to be the the uh, one of the two, uh, one of the extra seats they're adding because Florida's going to have three electoral votes. They're going to gain uh, one seat. It's just going to be the GOP seat uh, there, and then they're also going to probably uh, flip one of the Democrat seats, realistically speaking. And it's and I think it's going to be. Um, you know, I, I think it's likely that they're going to flip um, one of the Miami seats that's not majority minority, or they might draw out uh, Charlie Crist, who's another potential uh, target for them, and they could potentially draw out a um, a uh, in, a Democrat incumbent in Orlando. The um, but yeah, so I think that is it for Florida, um, Georgia. I think so. I think Georgia right now. Uh, the GOP in Georgia is in a tough spot because they can easily. Georgia is really easy to draw a dummy Mandarin. Trust me, I I've tried it before. You can easily draw a map where you can have like it, it'll be like a ten to four map, but it could easily be seven to seven by the end of the decade. So you can really easily draw a bad map for the GOP in Georgia. What I think they're gonna do is they're gonna go a little more cautious. People say, oh, they're gonna draw a ten to four map. That would not be smart for them for a lot of reasons. It could result in a, in a lot of lawsuits, and it could also result in a map that. Could easily uh, turn in uh, turn, backfire in just two election cycles. So right now the the delegation is eight to six. I think they're going to gain one seat. Um, it's likely they gain one seat. There's a small chance they keep it eight to six. I think they're going to gain one seat by just drawing out Carolyn Bordeaux 
and I think it, it's this seat, if I'm not mistaken. It could be this seat as well. Uh, I'm forgetting it, but it, it's one of these East Atlanta suburban districts. So, yeah, um, likely to try out her. There's a very small chance to go for a 10 to four map, but I'd say that's tilt. So not even, not. It, I don't think they're going to, realistically speaking. Um, Hawaii, nothing going on there. Idaho, I'm trying to do an alphabetical order. I think I'm just going to start going for, um, from uh, West East because I don't want to have because because I don't want to sing the song in my head every time that I do this video. So yeah, uh, Washington. It's I think Washington is going to stay the same. They've got an independent commission that says they're just going to protect incumbents. There's a very small chance, and I say very very small chance that they draw out one incumbent. It's definitely not going to be Jamie Herrera Butler though. So I think it maybe it would be this seat or something, but very small chance. I would not bet on it happening. Um, Oregon. So the GOP right now. So right now in Oregon, there are five congressional districts, and Oregon is gaining a seat. So the Democrats and the GOP have kind of come to an un, to an unofficial compromise that okay, the Democrats are going to solidify their four seats, but they're going to give the GOP the new seat as like if they vote for the plan and don't make it more complicated than they already have, whether that be walking on the legislature, which they've already done. Because they do need a quorum to vote on a map, and if and if every republic similar with what's going on in Texas, if every Republican member of the of the uh, state Senate just you know walks out of there, they can't vote on a map, and it goes to the state Supreme Court, which would be you know kind of a really weird map for the Oregon Democratic Party that they would not want to draw. So they want to draw the map on their own, and they're just going to say, okay, you guys can have two districts, and I'm drawing this out. They're like going to give the Republicans two R plus fifteen districts, then make all their districts safe. Uh, and make the look the map look pretty good. So I think the Republicans are likely to gain one seat. It's possible that the Democrats do go aggressive and draw a risky five to one map, but I, I I would still say that the Democratic Party in Oregon is is is, is going to give the GOP the seat that they have kind of come to that unofficial consensus that they're going to give them. Nevada, nothing to change there. If the Democrats are going to protect their incumbents, Montana, the GOP is going to gain a seat there for the short term, but long term, Montana gaining a seat is not good for the GOP because. The western part of Montana is shifting to the left, like, really, really uh, quickly. And so, in six years from now, like, like if they draw, like, an R plus 5 district in six years, 2026, that could be a lean Democrat district, based on how uh, quick Montana is bolting to the left. So, I think in Montana, short-term GOP is going to definitely gain a seat there, and they could gerrymander it to make it maybe R plus 8 or something, but uh, still not great news to the Montana GOP, in my opinion. Now, in New Mexico, I think that... Uh, the GOP is kind of they're they're in a tough spot here because their only incumbent Yvette Harrell is I think probably going to be drawn out, and the reason that the, that the New Mexico Democrats can be so aggressive is because they're one of this those states where they have an opportunity to kind of bring back an old incumbent in so chill Torres Small and Torres Small is a really good candidate for them for a couple reasons in that she gives them the luxury of being able to draw eight like there are three things that could happen what. I think the most unlikely scenario is that the is that the Democrats just draw a really cautious map in New Mexico. They make all their seats like D plus twenty five, and then give their and then give Yvette Harrell a vote sink, which I don't think that's going to happen. I think that they'd be stupid to do that because they're basically wasting every opportunity to get a seat. The second the second thing that they might do is they could go really aggressive and draw like basically three D plus ten to twelve districts, which you know wouldn't be dumb. I just think that you know they could go about it in a better way. Or the third option is to keep these two districts the same, which are basically safe Democrat. I know Cook PVI has them as like D plus nine, but these are both seats that I th that uh, you know in the special election the Democrats won this seat by twenty four, Joe Biden won it by twenty three, and I think that uh, Teresa Lugar Fernandez won her seat by like twenty one in November. So these are two essentially safe seats, and then they could make this seat Harrell's seat, uh, uh, basically toss maybe a D plus one seat, and assume that the Democrats are at someone like so chill Torres small. They can flip the seat back because Tora Small, I think she ran like six points ahead of Joe Biden in 2020. If if the seat was like even like R plus one or R plus two, I think they could easily flip it back. And with someone like Tora Small, who's a young candidate who'd be able to serve in Congress for a while, I think that they'd be giving themselves a pretty good map there. And you know, and assuming that like they cracked the oil regions down here, the, the district wouldn't trend away from them, and they just keep a three to O map. So I think that they're likely gonna make at the very least to vet Harrell's district more competitive and yes and if they get Torres Small to run for Congress again, which I think is likely, you know, she could absolutely um come back and win that seat. Uh in the Dakotas and Nebraska, not too much going on there. In Kansas, I would have like if you'd talked to me three months ago, I would have absolutely said that Shreets Davids is a goner and that, you know, that Kansas is absolutely gonna be a four to O map. But I think at this point, you know, 
with the Republicans kind of not eliminating too many single city district Democrats, whether that be Jimmy Armuth in Kentucky, uh, I guess a good example, or you know Mervin in Indiana, or potentially Jim Cooper in Tennessee, or I'm trying to think who else. Um, may p- potentially, or I guess Cleaver in Missouri too, kind of. Anyways. I think Trish David is going to be safe in here, not safe, but I think she's likely going to stay because of the trends we're seeing with other other seats. And I think that you know Kansas, the Supreme Court, people say does have a Democratic lean. So I think it, even though the court wouldn't necessarily overturn the map, I think that the GOP would be maybe a little scared of of the court drawing a, a, a more proportional, maybe even a two to two, somewhat kind of like a a one to two to one map. In Kansas, I think they're just going to keep David, give her a vote saying, you know, solidify Jim LaTurner in this district right here, kind of give her a vote saying it looks similar to this, just go across Kansas City, then go up to Topeka or something like that, so they're likely going to keep her. Oklahoma, they're just going to solidify Stephanie Bice, give her a safe seat. Texas is is basically the treasure trove of seats for the GOP in, in, um, in redistricting, and this is mostly because they have the ability to do basically whatever they want here. Of course, provide that they follow the VRA, so they're likely going to gain at least two seats, potentially three or four. Um, now, there are a couple seats, you know, they need to have at least two majority black seats. They're going to draw one in Dallas, one in Houston, in the likelihood. They need to have those Hispanic seats in the South. They need to keep uh, some of these districts in Houston that are majority minority as well, um, you know, whether it be a uh, combination of, of Hispanic voters and black voters, you know, that kind of thing. So they still do have to keep the Democrats in a couple seats, um, but that being said, they're still likely going to gerrymander Texas, which is really unfortunate considering, you know, some of these districts are already atrocious anyway, so, um, yeah. Now, going over to the state of Louisiana, there's been talk with the Democrats gaining a second seat here. I don't, I don't think it's likely. I think there's a very small chance that they do, maybe like a 30%, 20% chance they do, but it's worth mentioning because John Bell Edwards is the incumbent governor who is a Democrat who has said he would veto a Republican gerrymandered map. Uh, and he did did say that he thinks that the, that minority should be, should be given more representation in the state. So, absolutely, I think he would um, definitely want them to draw a second majority minority district that would be Democratic leaning. That being said, they don't really have a reason to because they do have a um, the uh, the over the override uh, two thirds majority that they need in the state legislature by one vote. And I know someone's going to say UEP, what are you saying? The Republicans are one vote short. They just have an independent the caucus with the, the caucuses with them that is making you say that. And you're right they, that they are technically a vote short, but that's like saying the Democrats only have 48 seats in the Senate because Bernie Sanders and Angus King technically aren't Democrats. They do have an independent, and I don't know too much about the guy, but he's likely to vote for a gerrymandered map from what I've heard, and I don't think that, that he would vote against his the party he caucuses with if they want to draw a gerrymandered map and just keep the delegation at 5-1. to one. Uh, So I think that they're, they're likely going to keep... Uh, uh, Louisiana uh, at one uh, Democratic seat, uh, that uh, majority black seat in New Orleans, but it's possible they draw a second Democratic seat. I, I just don't think that they would do that. Louisiana, um, again, similar to David's, like if you talked to me three months ago, I would have said for sure that, you know, a, a, you know a, Emmanuel Cleaver's, uh, Cleaver is a, go- is a goner, and he's going to get drawn out. But after looking at what we've seen with other trends, like especially in Kentucky, I think that he's going to stay in. He does have a good relationship with state legislature, so that makes it, you know, I, I guess he has a pretty promising case there. So I think he stays. Iowa, there's a, there's a chance that Cindy actually gets drawn out. The, the, the Iowa GOP can do one of two things because Iowa's weird because they can't, they can't really, uh, they can't cut, they can't split counties. So you just, so like, if you're drawing a map of Iowa, you can just forget about precincts you just want to use, just fill counties in. Which means the deviations are usually a little worse, but the maps look better. So they can either go like a really aggressive gerrymander where they get uh, a, um, a, a Des Moines. Uh, I, I'm forgetting the name of the county uh, that Des Moines is in. That's annoying. But the county of Des Moines has like 350,000 people. Just loop it in with a bunch of super Republican areas up here to make like an R plus 2 or 3 district. And then they can just gerrymander the rest of the map to make the, oh, those other seats R plus 5. So... That, that, that does have huge dummy, huge dummy manner of potential because Des Moines is trending left. Or what they can do, which, which I think that they're more likely to do, is just have a vote sync for the Democrats kind of in the middle of the state that goes from Des Moines to Johnson County, which would be around a D plus 20 or so seat, D plus 17, I, I actually think. And then just solidify their other seats to be like R plus 15 at least. So that's what the, that's what I think they're going to do. But of course, what we could see happen is we could see uh, Sydney actually get drawn out in a really aggressive gerrymander for the GOP. 
Um, so I'm gonna say it's it's possible, but not not likely. Minnesota's gonna say the same four to four, especially because Republicans the split control there. They're just gonna keep the delegation. Wisconsin likely gonna stay three to five. Michigan, the Democrats, nothing gonna change. Although I think the Democrats are gonna lose the seat because of re- because of the census. It's it, they currently have an eight to six lead on the delegation. I think it's, it's gonna go from eight to six to seven to six. Um, Illinois, the Democrats are gonna be really aggressive here. So right now the Democrats have a thirteen to five advantage. They're gonna go. Really brutal. I think they're gonna draw a fourteen to three map, where uh, they go and essentially. I mean, what I think they're gonna do is just have uh, two downstate districts solidify Sherry Bustos's district. She's retiring, but they're gonna make her district bluer, and then create a downstate district for the Democrats that goes from East New- East St. Louis up to Springfield. So Democrats are gonna gain one seat here. Indiana, the Republicans have a chance to flip this seat. But it's it's actually harder to crack Gary than you'd think because the area you know the city of Gary only has around a hundred thousand people, but the kind of the area is pretty blue. And you go from Gary across to South Bend, and you have a lot of Democratic voters up there, enough to make like almost two congressional districts. If you really tried to make two up here, you 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 could, um, or at least two competitive districts. So, I, I mean, they're probably not going to crack uh, Gary or this northern Democratic area. But there's a small chance that they uh, do. But I don't think they're going to as of right now, especially with the trends we've seen um, in Kentucky. Speaking of Kentucky, since we've been referencing so, it so much, uh, Mitch McConnell. So right now there's one Democratic incumbent, and it's uh, Jamie Armuth in this Louisville-based district. And Mitch McConnell has essentially said, I, I don't want uh, Jamie Armuth to be drawn out. You know, he's we should keep him here, and we should not gerrymander Kentucky, just keep the current delegation, which is a win for Democrats. And because, you know— I, I did say a couple months ago that, you know, he was basically a goner because they all they have to do is just crack Louisville a couple times and bam, they can draw a super safe 6-0 map in Kentucky. But what they're probably going to do is just keep Yarmouth in his district that will probably stay around the same. Uh, and then they're going to shore up Andy Barr in this seat. So Barr's seat is competitive, and he, he won by a lot in 2020, but he only won by three points in 2018. So they're likely just going to shore up his seat and keep, um, keep um, Yarmouth in his district. Ohio's the right now the GOP has a twelve to four um, advantage in the delegation. I think they're just going to make it twelve to three because the Democrats will be losing a seat. So one Democratic loss in Ohio, but not a Republican gain. South Carolina is going to stay the same, but they're just going to shore up Nancy Mace. North, North Carolina, the GOP is going to just gain a seat there because it's currently they're gaining a seat anyways. So the current delegation is nine to five, and they're just going to add the, the new seats just to be Republican seat. They're going to make it ten to five in Virginia. It's the right now the the, the GOP. Uh, is currently I, they have four to the eleven seats in uh, Virginia in, in Congress. I think this is chance that they might gain. Uh, they, it might go from seven to four to six to five, but that that's only if it, if the Supreme Court draws a map, which would only happen if the Democrats and Republicans can't agree on a compromise um, map, because both parties do actually have the ability to veto some maps. But we're still talking about a um, a uh, I guess a scenario that's unlikely to happen but it could happen so i'll, I'll leave that there in west virginia the new is just going to lose a seat um because they're losing an electoral vote which means they're losing a seat maryland the democrats are probably going to make an eight to map but th- they might run into some legal problems especially with a s- kind of conservative court in maryland not really sure how to describe it but it might not even go to court anyways because you know it, it would be hard for that to go to court anyways so i i, I think it's kind of complicated you know I'm less confident in in a in an eight to Maryland map than I was two months ago, but I'm still fairly confident in the Democrats' ability to gerrymander Maryland eight to Not not that it's a good thing, but I think it's likely to happen. Pennsylvania right now the map is nine to nine. That's the only split delegation in uh, the United States, and I think that all that's going to happen is since they're losing a seat, it's 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 going to be a GOP loss to make the map nine to eight. So, um, yeah, 9-8 map well, in Pennsylvania, especially with the commission being chaired by a Democrat. Um, you know, if, this, if the state legislature had control, I, I might say 9-8 in favor of the GOP, but since the commission is a more Democratic-leaning commission, I think it's going to be 9-8 in favor of the Democrats. New Jersey, the GOP might gain a seat there if the commission draws a more favorable map to them, which they might. It's always possible, but it, it, it's not a for sure thing. In New York, the Democrats are definitely going to draw, or def, I'd say they're probably going to gain at least two seats there, with um, Nicole Maliotakis being drawn out in Staten Island. Her seat is a is a competitive Republican-leaning seat, this seat right here in Staten Island, um, and they're likely going to draw her out. And then Claudia Tenney, who won, who, who won re-election by like 100 votes, 
in this seat right here. They're going to likely draw her out, and then they could also potentially draw out a couple other Republicans, like Elise Stefanik, for example, and maybe shore up, um, potentially shore up, um, uh, what's his name, Antonio Delgado's seat. Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Vermont, nothing really happening there. All, uh, obviously, Democrats are going to hold on to all their seats there. New Hampshire, the GOP has a chance at, at picking up uh, a uh, you may picking up a seat there. But here's here the thing, or here's the thing. I don't know why I say here are the thing, but here's the thing in New Hampshire. It's Chris and Nunu, If he wants to send it, um, if he wants to have a good chance at winning a Senate race there, he has to really. He would have to make it look like he's bipartisan because New Hampshire is a Democratic leaning state, and Mitch McConnell is not a popular guy there. He has to not tie himself as as much to the mainstream GOP as he does to the New Hampshire GOP or to a moderate Republican that he says he is. So he would really have to, you know, if he wanted to win that race and if he wanted to run for Senate, he would have to uh, make his image look good. And he had said that he would veto a gerrymandered map uh, because the G the Republicans have control of the New Hampshire state legislature. They flipped in early in 2020. It was quite unexpected, but they did. And, um, you know, he would have to veto a gerrymandered map. And he said he's going to, so that's one roadblock for the GOP. They also have to factor in the fact that New Hampshire's hard to gerrymander because they only have two seats there. And both Democrats uh, uh, ran ahead of the top of the ticket. They ran ahead of Joe Biden in both their seats. So we could see a map where the GOP makes one seat a couple points more Republican. But at the same time, it would, you know, it, it, we could see a GOP gerrymander where both seats stay blue. So potential GOP pickup in New Hampshire, but really complicated. And I don't think that they're going to. Uh, it's it, it it's, it's not a lock. So I think Matt can stay two to zero. Oh. Lastly, in Maine, I think I think their districts are going to stay pretty similar. You know, the the, the Maine state constitution says that I think you need a two thirds majority in the in the state uh, legislature, what the Democrats are close to, but they don't have, and they're likely just going to draw a fair map and keep Golden uh, in a competitive seat, and then Shelley Pring Pringree, her seat down here is going to stay the same. So that's it. So the Republicans have more have more uh, targets, I guess you could say, but they're less solid than the Democrats. The Democrats, I think, have really solid base, and they're in a much better position in terms of redistricting than I would have said they were maybe three or four months ago. So that being said, that's it for this video. This is a long video. I'm not going to drag it on for any longer. And in case I sound uh, congested, I do. I'm I'm feeling fine. I, I don't know why, but the second I sat down to film this video, I just started feeling weird in my nose, but uh, I'm sorry about that. I mean, if you heard a little bit of, I guess congestion my apologies but um i hope you enjoyed this video if you did please leave a like subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and i'll see you all in the next video